Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to our uh, Nebraska Library Commission webinar on our American 2021 American Rescue Plan Act uh, formula grants. Um, actually, we're going to talk about multiple grant opportunities, but that's our main focus for today. Uh, ARPA, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, and what the funding we have here from the Library Commission to provide to libraries. Uh, I am Krista Porter. I'm the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and with me is Sam Shaw. Sam, introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm Sam Shaw. I'm the Planning and Data Services Coordinator and also the LSTA Coordinator. Lots of us have many hats that we wear. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we are going to go over uh, what the Nebraska Library Commission has received from ARPA. Uh, via the new American Rescue Plan Act and what we have to offer out to libraries, as I said. Um, officially, this webinar is scheduled for an hour, but we will go as long as it takes to answer all of your questions. Um, go to webinar. This is our account here. We will not get cut off right at 3 p.m. Central Time, so don't worry about that. Uh, type in your questions to the questions section there. Um, whenever you think of them or anything you're wondering about, we might get to them as we go through the slides. Uh, we might have some new questions you guys have that we hadn't thought about. Um, but that's what we're here for, to make sure you get all the information you need about this so that you can um, apply for these grants and these um, funding opportunities. So, what do we have here? General overview here of ARPA. Um, ARPA, this is the American Rescue Plan Act that I'm sure everyone has heard about, passed by Congress. A uh, huge amount of money in this bill, this new stimulus bill in response to the still the ongoing um, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, $1.9 trillion in total. Uh, we have some of that. <laughs> Uh, it has been, um, there are, it, there's, if you go and look at the act, there are tons of different opportunities in there for funding from multiple agencies, multiple organizations, cities, counties, states um, who have been awarded certain parts of this funding. Um, and so we're going to talk about what we have here through the Library Commission, but look for other opportunities in the ARPA um, that you might be able to apply for, whether you as a library or your city or your county on behalf of you. There's going to be other things in there as well that you can apply for. Um, as part of this, the IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services, was awarded $200 million to um, use as they see fit. They're using some of it to expand their own programs and grants, but they awarded in the grants to states programs that the Nebraska Library Commission gets um, more money from every year, uh, $2.4 million specifically of this ARPA money. Uh, for the for us, that's a huge amount of money. We've never had that big a pot before, I don't think, Sam. Is that correct? <laughs> Not that I know of. Yeah. So this is a lot of money to give out. We do get money every year from IMLS, um, but it's not nearly this much. <laughs> um, to start with, we are doing some, just so you're aware of where some of the money is going, some statewide initiatives to um, add to some some things that we do. Money is being a lot is allotted to the Nebraska Overdrive Libraries Group to add titles to that um, those ebooks that they have there. Uh, lender compensation program. There'll be more money put into that for libraries to who lend um, interlibrary loan. Um, we've awarded some funding to our four regional library systems, so they all have a little bit of extra money to work with. We are also paying for the next annual, the next year subscription to both Niche Academy and Reader Zone. Niche Academy has been used with our Library Innovation Studios program and with some of our continuing education training. And Reader Zone is for doing summer reading programs or any sort of reading program. We actually started with Reader Zone last year with the CARES Act grant funds, paid for it the first year. And the second year we're using ARPA funds to continue with it for another year. So you can use that um, for free and no cost to you for any summer reading programs, but any sort of reading competitions you might have. Um, and we're adding titles to both our book club kits here at the Library Commission, very popular of course, and our professional collections for librarians. So you'll see more titles added to that as well. Uh, specifically for the grants we were giving out. So those are statewide programs that we're just putting money into, into for things that we provide. But then we have actually three different grants that we're gonna be using some as ARPA funding for as well. Um, the big one is gonna be the formula grant program that we're talking about today. Um, 1.4 million of the um, 2.4 that we got is, has been allocated specifically to that program. Um, and we'll get into all the details of that in a bit. 
um, next. But I also want to make sure that you're aware there are also two more competitive grants that will be coming up uh, where we are adding ARPA funds to. These are our library improvement grants and our youth grants for excellence, the two grants that we usually have every, um, annually. Uh, sometimes library improvement isn't every year, but <laughs> um, both of those we are adding more funding to using the ARPA funds. Usually we have for each of those in the last few years, 20-ish thousand dollars of allotted to each one. So not a huge amount, but enough to award some grants. Uh, using the ARPA funds, we are putting, I believe it's $150,000 into the library improvement grants and $75,000 into the youth grants for excellence. So as you're thinking about these formula grants we're going to talk about and get into all the details about here, also think about these two upcoming uh, competitive grants coming up that we plan to open up in August, as it says here. If you have a, something for youth or teens that you want to do a program, apply for a youth grant. If you have something that is makerspace related or um, upgrading your library automation system or something more technology related, uh, look for applying for the library improvement grants. And then use your formula grants for anything that doesn't fall into those two categories. So think big, think of anything you might want to do and you've got a, we've got a lot more money to coming for these two um, upcoming uh, competitive grants. Something else that's new and is, is because of it being ARPA coming from ARPA funding, all legally established public libraries, tribal libraries, and institutional libraries will be eligible for these two grants, uh, the Library Improvement Grants and the Youth Grants for Excellence. That also goes for the formula grants we're going to talk about too, but I wanted to mention that in relation to these two because that is different from how we've usually done both of those grants. Except for this year, special year, just one time, up, um, opportunity. Usually our, those two grants are accredited libraries and state-run institutional institutional libraries. Because it's ARPA funding, we are opening it up to anybody. So um, if you've never applied to a grant for, to us for a grant because you are not accredited, now is your chance. One time, get on it while we have this available. <laughs> Um, and we have a, a question, which I did see the email from you also as well, Matt, I was going to reply. I want to know if there's a cap per library that can be requested in the library improvement grants. Uh, we've never had a cap before uh, for them. I would not say we have one now. I, do, I wouldn't think that's a grant that I run. I would not want to put a cap in there. I would say we do have a limited more than what usual, but a specific amount of money. And it would depend on how many grants we get and how much they are all for. We do give partial grants, both for the library improvement and youth. So um, both of those, you know, you may apply for something, and if we don't have enough to go to completely fund your full amount, we may say, sorry, we were limited, we can only do 50% or whatever it comes out to be. So there's no cap, just ask for what you want, and we'll see what happens, see what we can do with it. And all you got to do is try. <laughs> Um, ah, okay, so here's a question. I think this is something that maybe, uh, Sam, we might, I don't know if you want to do it now or wait to talk, explain about what are considered the institutional libraries. I think that's what the question someone wants to know. Do private universities count? Um, no, that's no. not what we mean by institutional. Um, but private universities, yeah, we, we are doing money to public libraries, tribal libraries, and institutional as far as like corrections. Is that what we're talking about? That's what we're talking about as far as institutional. Yeah. State-run um, institutions like corrections, um, prison libraries, HHS, regional center libraries, um, state-run veterans homes uh, would be another one that would qualify as an institutional library under this um, these grants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for universities and colleges, uh, we don't. There's there's money coming from the Department of Education and from mm -hmm. that side that you should go and look for um, here at the Library Commission. This is who we are um, able to provide grants to. And this is based off of our LSTA five-year plan, really, right, Sam? I mean, who we serve in these grant programs. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to talk about formula grants now and look for more information coming about the two um, competitive grants. Basically, these are two regular ones, just with a lot more money and uh, fewer restrictions. And available to non-accredited libraries too. Exactly. Yes. All right. So formula grants. Thank so you. so mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about formula grants because um, I'm dealing with those. So 
Uh, kind of an overview of formula grants. We've never really done them in the state before. A lot of other states do them that get larger LSTA funds from IMLS. Mm -hmm. they, do, they do these kinds of formula grants on a regular basis. We've never done them before. We've kind of tended to focus more on statewide projects, but with this you know, kind of windfall of money, um, we thought that we would try this this time to try and get it, get them out, get the money out to libraries. Um, and so kind of an overview of the, of how these work is, um, these are non-competitive grants. So there's a amount that you would apply for, uh, and then receive there's, there's, um, not, uh, they're not like the other ones that Krista was talking about where there's a limited amount of funds and then, um, everybody applies for it and then the applications are reviewed. This is money that's allocated to each library that's eligible. Um, and as Krista mentioned before, public, tribal, and institutional libraries, we kind of talked about inst state institutional libraries. Um, we get a lot, of, a lot of questions about public libraries and what qualifies as a public library. Of course, that definition is different from state to state. Um, in Nebraska, we um, define a public library in the statute, um, as in the slide here, it says legally established. That means that the library has been established for the use um, by the local governing board, so the city council, uh, board of trustees of the village, um, for the free use of the citizens of that um, city, village, or county. Um, and then the library must have a board of at least five members. So those are the two requirements to be a public library um, in Nebraska. That's the definition that's in the statute. Yeah, and on the ARP minimum things, there's other things that you would do as a library, but those are the two sure. minimum criteria that makes you legally established and eligible for. Right, and it's it's kind of confusing because there's a federal definition um, yeah. that talks about paid staff and open hours and all this sort of thing. So, and I think that uh, that muddies the waters sometimes. Um, so it's good to have this on paper. And this is also, the statutory links are also on the formula grant um, part of our website. So if you actually wanna go and look at that statute, there's a link to it there under Title 51 of the Nebraska statutes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, yeah, we should mention we have a website all about this and it's later on in the slides. It has all this as well laid out um, as what we have here. Um, I mean, Tried to link to anything and everything we could think of that would explain ever, anything. <laughs> right. These slides are kind of a summary of what's on the website, but if you want a more comprehensive look at a lot of these things, they're available on. We tried to provide it on the on the ARPA part of our website. So, and, and if and if you don't write down the link, you can always just type in ARPA in the search box on our website, and these pages should come right up for you. So, you want to click next slide there, Krista? Yeah. There we go. And so the way that we've determined um, these formula grants is we have a base allocation for every library and then a per capita amount. So we've used the most recent census data for the library's legal service area. Um, so for public and tribal libraries, we have a base allocation of 3,750 and then a per capita amount of just over 25 cents, 0.275 per capita. So that's in addition to the base payment that libraries would be eligible to receive. And then the institutional formula is a little bit different. It's um, a base amount of $1,500 plus $2.50 per capita. And that's based upon the average resident population. Um, so if you have a correctional institution, for instance, that you know the count fluctuates from day to day, mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the average. Um, the average, not the design capacity, but the average um, number of residents or inmates. Um, one thing to note is that these formula grants should be considered as a one-time award. We don't expect Congress to pass another $1.9 trillion bill um, and allocate more money to IMLS. I mean, it's possible, but we probably should think about this as a one-time award. So don't um, depend on that coming now. Use in response to the, the pandemic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's, it shouldn't be looked at as something maybe that you would receive every year. It's more to be looked at as a one-time award, mm -hmm. okay? One-time special case, um, and also I'll explain a little bit too, um, because we've had some people question, well, I've already gotten some things using the CARES Act. Uh, what about, you know, do I really need to? 
come up with something to buy. And we'll get into that when we talk about what's eligible and whatnot. This is this here, these swim grants, this is already allotted to your library. It's not Correct. a competition. Yep. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't get it, someone else will, or, or you got to be a root. You automatically have 3750 plus that per capita ready for us to send out to you and use. So right. come up with something to use it for. Get it. Grab this money while you can. <laughs> And it's not a race. So if if, if no. a bunch of people apply before you do, um, mm -hmm. and you still apply before the deadline, you you still get the money if you meet those minimum requirements. If you're an eligible and library, I will say, if you don't apply and it's getting close to the deadline, which is actually um, the next slide here, we will be reaching out to you to find out why. Right. There will mm -hmm. be nudging from us and our system directors, regional system, library system directors. I, I've already know that at least one of them is going to do. That has said that, um, we will reach out to you and find out if we don't hear from you, why aren't you, What is there something we can do to help you figure out how to use this? What can we do to make use of this? This is, you know, we wanna get this out to everybody. And I would also say on a later, there's a later slide to, with a link to a, a chart or a form or the formula chart. So it would list your city and your library and the um, allocated amount um, that you would receive. Um, if you meet those minimum requirements of a public library, for instance, and then submitted your application and agreed to the terms and conditions. Um, if for some reason we've missed your, we went, went by the best information that we have available, mm -hmm. but if for some reason we've missed your library, please contact us, that way we can get our records updated. Um, we think we've got every library that, um, that would meet that criteria, but if for some reason we have missed you, um, let us know and we'll we'll take a look at that and see if we can get you added. Yeah, there's been a little tweaking even since we opened this up on a week ago. So, <laughs> um, and, and as Sam said, this is our first time doing one of these formula grants. So uh, we're learning as we go. Yes. So things <laughs> may change throughout the process if we realize, oh wait, that we should have done something different or somebody questioned something and we didn't think about that, you know, we will you know, adjust as needed. Uh, Generally, Absolutely. the idea is get the money out to you guys as easily and quickly mm -hmm. as possible. Um, now we do have a couple of questions that I'm going to stop and, and, and uh, sure. talk about right now because it is related to um, the board, um, having a library board of consisting of at least five members. And two people have the same same question, and I'm sure other people maybe think about this, and I'll uh, address this one because it's related to things I work with. What if the board doesn't have five members? Um, we have four with the fifth one not being approved till August. Um, what if we're down one board member? Um, what's the deadline to having one and still being eligible? That's okay. We know board members come and go. <laughs> uh, if you are currently down one because you're waiting for someone to apply or you're waiting as, for the official approval from your, your city, that's okay. Uh, you do not have to have actually five people and give us all of their names at the minute you apply, as long as as a regular, as part of your regular library board, there are five spots and most off, most of the time you've got five people in those spots, that's okay. We know there's gonna be transitions between members or um, things like this and, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, what you can't do is regularly not have a board or, well, we only have, we only require three members on a board or something. No, you have to have your board set up with bylaws that state that you have five board members. That's how many members, this is, this is a state statute that says this in order to be, you know, you can be a library and not have five members on your board, but you're not legally established per state mm -hmm. statute. That's where the, the line is. We've got many libraries in the state. We've got some libraries that are not their reading rooms are just so small that they don't and that's fine those libraries are welcome to exist and do their thing but they're not legally established because they don't have that board the bylaw is stating we have five members so it's okay if you're in transition it it's not a yes hard and fast if there's not five people's names that we know you're out of luck no that's not the case <laughs> so go ahead and apply um All right, so that, yeah. That one? Yeah. So a lot of you, if you're a public librarian, you probably got an email from me earlier, um, about a week ago, actually, Tuesday, last Tuesday, um, indicating that these formula grants are now open. Um, so we've received, I think, 35 applications as of this morning already. Nice. Um, people that have applied. 
Um, the deadline to apply, you have some time, a lot of time actually, December 31st, 2021. Um, that's the deadline to submit your application. And um, purchases made between March 15th, 2021 are eligible for reimbursement. So if you made a purchase after March 15th, 2021, that's eligible to be reimbursed um, from these funds. And then final purchases must be made um, no later uh, before May 31st, 2022. Um, so you have some time uh, to make eligible purchases. That's the final drop dead date for that. Um, another, two, two other requirements um, that we have is that you must submit um, a grant completion report and copies of your invoices before June 30th of 2022. Um, there's a completion report. We have a preview report online right now. It's kind of in a word, I believe it's in a word format. Mm -hmm. um, that will be switching to an online submission. So you can preview that completion report, but if, um, if you have your information and want to submit it, just wait for now until that um, is made available electronically. It'll be similar to how you submit your application um, all online. Um, and the reason we require a completion report is we have to report back to IMLS um, how these funds are spent. So um, if you want to look at that completion report, and familiarize yourself with um, what we're asking for in the completion report, you can go ahead and preview that online. Um, but later on, it will be submitted um, electronically. Right. And for those of you that did uh, apply for the CARES Act grants last year, you'll mm -hmm. recognize this timeline. This is pretty much the same kind of timeline as as last year's. That you there's a, there's a March date. Where you could so you could look you know submit invoices even before you applied for the funding, um, and then you've got that deadline of May and then June for the reports. It's a similar timeline as last year's. And I think this is in a later slide, but I'll talk about it now since we're mentioning invoices. So if you have your invoices and you want to submit those. You can e scan them and email them to me. You can make paper copies and send them to me. Um, you can also fax them if you'd prefer to fax them. Um, just send them to my attention. And we can put it in your file. Um, if it was, say, a, a something that, you know, a reimbursement of a purchase that already occurred, you know, after that March 15th date, um, you can send those anytime. Yeah. It's just the completion report that we'd like to submit electronically at a later date. Okay, next mm -hmm. slide. So we have a lot of goals of this, pro <laughs> of this program that came from IMLS. These are IMLS's broad, three broad ranging goals for the ARPA um, program that has become goals of the formula grant program because um, these are, this is the framework that we have to um, operate under. And so these, the, the first one is kind of deals with digital content, um, accessibility, um, particularly in the areas of education, health, and workforce development. Um, when you look at that, I would also, and we'll get to this later on, I would also be my, you know, caution you to be mindful of other sources of funding. So right now there's a lot of other sources of funding for these types of projects. Um, mm -hmm. So you need to be aware of that. Um, if there's another source of funding, um, for some of these projects, maybe that's a better use of funds and then your formula grant money could be used for something else. So keep that in mind too. And Krista, I think I'll talk about that later mm -hmm. with some of the E-rate programs that are going on and other um, sources of funding. Um, the second one is kind of, kind of mirrors, I think what we dealt with with CARES Act, which is kind of like response to the pandemic. Um, these are health, health and safety protocols, public health protocols, um, you know, making your areas, you know, more safe and more accessible to people. And then the third one is kind of this broad umbrella of, you know, library services. Um, and they give some examples here about personnel, technology, training, materials, supplies, and equipment. Um, the thing to keep in mind is you're talking about meeting the needs of your community. And we realize that your in one community may have different needs than another one. And that's one of the reasons I think that we wanted to do this formula grant program is to actually put the money out into specific libraries because they have different needs in one community as opposed to another. So, 
Um, um, the, the third one I think is important, and I've mentioned this a lot in our discussions about it. The first two are very much related to what was from the CARES Act uh, last year. Uh, CARES Act, this I think, I kind of think of the ARPA as an expansion of what you could ask for in the CARES Act in response to the same in, in event, the COVID-19 pandemic. But last year with CARES Act, it was very much more limited to mm -hmm. hotspots, uh, getting digital content out there, doing virtual programming, you know, nothing in person for safety reasons. And then all of that PPE stuff, the pandemic um, cleaning, masks, yeah. mm -hmm. cleaning supplies, uh, plexiglass shields at your desks, all that kind of things of the immediately responding to being safe, um, being safe from the pandemic and then providing services to our um, community. With this one, they've realized you still may need some of that pandemic, you know, it's still still full blast in you know, many, many places, um, but there's other things that you may need money for now as well. Uh, budgets may have been cut because of tax um, receipts being down. Uh, you may have had to just cut back on things in general and you wanna try and ramp things back up. Um, so ARPA really expands it out to um, anything digital content you're wanting to get. And then that last one of supporting library services needs, that's pretty much anything you do as a library. You have technology, it, yeah. training, mm -hmm. materials, you need equipment. Um, we've actually, we've had webinars with IMLS about this and with materials, something that people asked about and was not before. You can up, um, update your collection. You can buy print mm -hmm. books things you actually lend out to people with this, books, DVDs, whatever you might need, any equipment you need in the library. So think of anything that you either have had to not, haven't been able to do, and you have this one shot deal to do it, or, you know, get creative of something you were, you know, wishful thinking. <laughs> and if we could, if we had a little jolt of 3,000 something dollars, hey, yeah. It could be in response, yeah, and it could be in response to maybe some how your services have changed because of the pandemic exactly. or in response to the pandemic, but it could also just fall under that umbrella of your normal day-to-day -day operations. Mm -hmm. so I think yeah. it's broadly encompassing a lot of those things. Yeah, which is a great, I think, about this, that you think beyond pandemic, but right. you have focus areas too, and you're just mentioning that fourth one there, the new service models new things we've come up with new ways of doing business and we might want to make that permanent we could use this money to do that yeah so these are kind of the imls bud buzzwords that they've put out for focal areas um a lot of these look, should look familiar to a lot of people workforce development digital inclusion is a big thing um and that's also an area where there's a lot of other funding that's available right now especially in rural areas um, equity and diversity and inclusion um, new service models, so that may be, you know, how things have shifted more to electronic ebooks. Um, as we looked at our data, like from last year, print circulation went way down, electronic circulation went way up. So, you know, maybe that's a trend that continues as some of these people during the pandemic um, maybe look to ebooks instead of print books, and maybe now they're more regular ebook users. I don't know. To get used um, to it and and realize, be. hey, I like this. Now I'm going to do it even more. Yeah, so you may have you know increased capacity for that, and then social and this, this is like the CARES Act stuff that we talked about. Social and physical distancing measures. Um, this may be reconfiguration of outdoor spaces. Um, that's one example that could be you know something to address that. I know that a lot of people. Um, have already undertaken these projects. You know, like the plexiglass shield on the front desk. Mm -hmm. increased hand sanitizing stations um, but that could be something that um, would be you know one of these IMLS focus areas mm -hmm. and if you didn't you know weren't able didn't apply for the CARES Act grant last year which that was a competitive grant with evaluations mm -hmm. and we um, did award you know some partial grants um, if you're still working on some of this stuff that you're thinking about last year and you didn't get the grants you didn't do it use this money now. Now you've got a second chance to do some of the things that maybe you weren't able to do last year because you you didn't get awarded the grant or we only were allowed to give you partial funding. Yeah, or maybe in some cases libraries are, were closed for a long period, longer period of time too and now they're reopening back to a normal type schedule. Longer than expected, um, yeah. That's um, possible. Oh, we do have a question here. Where is it now? Uh, there we go. 
I'm just reading it as well. Hmm. Um, I would think the answer would be yes to this question, but would an, I'll see what you think, Sam. Would a new website count as digital content? I'm going to be writing up an RFP for a new website. Could I use the funds to help fund that project? I, maybe, yeah. My maybe. initial reaction would be yes, but I would want to double check and make sure. Um, I would say to that person, send us an e send us the question in email, and we'll we'll double check. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, it sounds like it would be. An, it, I mean, sometimes when we've had some questions from libraries, the key is you know, explain the why of it. It really helps. With um, mm -hmm. we need to check with IMLS about you know any of it. Yeah, but yeah, it's digital content. It's it's ex offering um, service. Mm -hmm. And you know, it may it may be one of those things where we need more information because what you know, what is the purpose of the web the new website? Is it to promote um, those digital resources and content that you know you're using maybe part of your money on? Then it would seem to make sense to me. Um, you know, if you didn't have overdrive and now you're adding overdrive and you want the website to you know make that more visible or promote it in the community, mm -hmm. I think that then that sounds like a definitely an allowable use of the funds, yeah. but I would probably want a little bit more information. Yeah, and something that's good about this too is, um, and for people who are wondering, what about this, what about that? I would say apply for the funding, you'll get the funding, mm -hmm. and then send us the invoices or send us the information about what you would like to say you use that funding for, and we can then, um, even after you've received the funding from us, we can, I guess approve or deny, you know, mm -hmm. work with you on is that actually eligible or not? And then, you know, if that website it turns out well, it's not eligible, you still have till you know next May to find something else that you would use that money for. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say come up with a pro project. This isn't a typical grant where you come up with a project, tell us what you're doing, and then we decide if we give you the money. It's kind of the opposite. We have money for you. Just ask for it. Then just they'll discuss what you could, what you might use it for. Mm -hmm. Ask us for the money, we send it to you, start sending us invoices, sending us ideas, and we'll go back and forth if need to and decide, yes, that one, no, not that one. Find something else. You, you got till next May to find out, come up with things that could be eligible, and there's, we should be able to find something. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so one of, the, one of the basic IMLS objectives, and this came from the head of IMLS, and I thought it was a good quote. He said that the purpose of what they want to do with this ARPA funding that they're distributing to states, the part of their 200 million that they receive from Congress, is to provide direct immediate help to people outside the library and in the community to respond to and recover from the pandemic. Um, so that's one of the things I think that you need to be thinking about um, with your projects is you know, how has COVID affected my community and how can the library specifically respond to that um, to help the community? And I think this one too, being different from CARES, that recover part. Mm -hmm. Last year, really in the midst, it was just responding immediately. What do we need to do right now? This is thinking now that we are in some places moving out of it, what are these new things we're going to be doing that help us recover and, and move on and add these services? Mm -hmm. So, and I think on the next slide, there's a little bit more information here. So, um, on our website, we have a really comprehensive list of some examples of what you can spend your award on. Um, so, I would encourage everyone to look at that. It's kind of broken down by category um, of, you know, examples of what would be like an allowable cost. Um, so, check that out. Um, it's There's far too many to list here in this webinar today. So, if you look on there, you can kind of, and that may give you some ideas too um, mm -hmm. for projects that maybe you want to fund. Um, it's kind of the highlights here. We will say that um, anything that's inter internet um, access or devices that connect to the internet, you must have SIPA compliance. And Krista is the contact contact um, person in Nebraska for that as a part of E-rate. So if you have a question about SIPA or um, whether or not your project would require filtering, um, as required by SIPA, check with Krista and she can probably answer those questions. And then thirdly, um, any equipment that you intend to purchase that has a cost of over $5,000, 
requires pre-approval. So you would need to send um, us information about that equipment purchase that you intend to make because we need to get um, approval, pre-approval from IMLS. That's and that is a required. individual item is five thousand. Not your entire project is five thousand. Correct. So yeah, that's specific. one piece, like one piece of equipment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're so buying, if you're, and this is a bad example, like five desktop computers, and they're each a thousand dollars. Next to five thousand, no. No. Those, correct. Yeah. But if you're buying a computer that's over five thousand, which I'd love to see what that is, <laughs> <laughs> then you'd have to check in. Maybe a laser cutter or something that's over. Yes, so those big makerspace equipment things or something. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it wouldn't be allowed. It just requires pre-approval. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just check with us ahead of time. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions that relate to this, so I'm going to jump into those now. Uh, is uh, okay. Is SIPA compliance required if you're just buying monitors, just computer mm -hmm. monitors? No, SIPA, the key to SIPA is, is the thing you're buying related to providing internet access. Mm -hmm. So it would be your routers, um, routers, switches, cables, um, hotspots, all those things that actually provide the internet service. That's where SIPA comes to place if you're providing the service. Yes, monitors show you the internet, but they can show you other things too that are not. So mm -hmm. um, not if it's just for computer monitors. No, you would not need to be SIPA compliant for that. Um, and then we have a related question. Can some of the funds be used for equipment for fiber that was not covered by E-rate funds? Yes, we have asked this question. Can this money be used to cover that extra? Um, and yes, so if you've got, if you if you participate in E-rate and you've uh, an equipment purchase or something and you have your part that needs to be paid for, you can use this money to cover that if you want to. Or if you didn't apply for E-rate or it got denied or something, whatever. Yes, yep. Then on the extra cost of e that you do have to put into E-rate, yes, you can use this for. Um, and I do see your other question, Karen, and we're going to get to that in a second here, so I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> um, and so going back to our explanation, yes, Monica, what if we spend the money and it's not approved? Well, what if we spend the money and it's not approved? So we just get the money and then we get ideas approved. Yes, exactly. That's actually a good example. We get you the money and then start either send us invoices and we'll let you know yes or no or if you're wondering about a thing like well what about the website or about something we've already had some people asking us well, what about this what about that um you know just start having a conversation with us about it and we'll figure out what is and isn't eligible for you right if, and if you have a project in mind and you had a question about whether or not it'd be an allowable expense you more than well welcome to email us and mm -hmm. and yeah. we'll um give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down if it's questionable um that way you're not going out and um, making the purchase and then finding out later on that it's not an allowable cost. Right, if um, you're depending so, on so the yeah, if you, if you definitely want to get pre-approval, you don't need to have pre-approval, but, mm -hmm. if you, but if for your own peace of mind you want that, just feel free to drop an email. We may mm -hmm. ask a few follow-up questions about the project. We should be able to tell you ahead of time if it's an allowable cost or not allowable cost. If you should go through with it, forward with it or not, yeah. And if it is questionable, you may be able to shift your budget around um, for some of those operating things that it would be an allowable cost and then use, you know, your regular operating budget from the city for some of these special projects. Okay, here's another question about another question. Um, equipment that's expensive cost. I was thinking about a laser cutter for the library makerspace. If it costs more than $5,000, can we use some money from our budget? Yeah, so you're not asking for $5,000 from mm -hmm. this money. What do you think, Sam? Is that, <laughs> is that how would, it's supposed to work? Or? I, would still, I would still think that that probably needs pre-approval from IMLS yeah. because the money is going towards one piece of equipment that the total cost of that equipment is more than $5,000. Anything that's a big ticket so, item they want to put their check off on, yeah. So yeah. reach out to us and let us know about it and then we'll go through the process, yeah. Right. So um, I think we, on the next slide, we have some of the unallowable cost examples. Maybe that'll answer some questions. We do. Um, um, mm -hmm. yeah. But let's see, um, would e-readers need to be SIPA compliant? Um, 
if you are connecting them to the internet yeah, to can. access the um, service, then yes, you'd have to, because you're using the internet for mm -hmm. it, you would then need to be in compliance with the SIPA uh, um, as far as having uh, filtering software on your internet connection or on the device, I believe it would be. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, so it says, thanks, got it. You're gonna have a big job. Yes, we are, but we're happy to do it. Giving, giving away money is something we like to do. It's not necessarily a bad problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right. Um, and what is it? Ah, what is, uh, wants to know about the link on the NLC webpage, it looks for us. If you go, and we had the link in the slides earlier and there's another link coming up too, but if you go onto our website and, um, to use a search box and type in ARPA, A R P A, mm -hmm. you'll find it. Also, the link to the Formula Grants webpage is in the session description for this webinar. So mm -hmm. if you signed up for this, you know, go on to our calendar, um, and there's I link to that. Uh, it's also in the announcement on our blog on the main page. You should still see that right on the main page of the commission's website. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, on the website, we have a number, and we've gotten a lot of questions even already about ineligible costs, um, and I imagine we'll get a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, so on our website, we've kind of listed the, we, we, we're working under two frameworks. Basically, we have, you know, IMLS's general LSTA rules about ineligible costs, and then we have rules that apply to just these ARPA funds. So it's kind of under two different umbrellas here. I'll make sure, um, yeah. Yeah, so on our website, we have a general list of, you know, what definitely are ineligible costs. Some of the highlights of these are food, beverages, sales tax, aren't, those aren't allowable costs. And we always get questions about construction projects, um, which are fairly common. And I'll try and answer these. Uh, I'll try and provide a couple analogies that might help. Um, this is kind of what IMLS has told us. So if you're looking at construction or remodel expenses, those generally are not going to be allowed, those capital projects. Um, they do allow what they call construction light. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a, a phrase that um, the yeah, IML program, program <laughs> officer has said. And kind of the, the description that she's given is, like if it involves a shovel and digging, it's, it's not going to be allowed. But if it involves something that you can do like with a drill and a screwdriver, that it probably would be allowed and kind of an analogy that I've thought of is like that I think is appropriate to the pandemic say your library wanted to inc increase your air circulation um, in your space and you wanted to install like a portable air cleaner that just plugs into the wall and maybe some fans portable fans um, those would be allowable costs under these rules now, if you wanted to hire an HVAC contractor to come in and modify your HVAC system to filter the air, um, you're using construction trades, and that's going to be a construction project that's not allowed. Hiring um, an outside company to have to needing to hire an outside company to come in and modify something—that's kind of the line you're crossing. Right. Your own um, staff kid with a screwdriver go and install something, yeah. put up a fan on the on the ceiling fan or something that's okay but if you have to have a company come in that's where lsda funds can't be used yeah and another example is like meeting rooms um say you bought a tv or a projector to install in a meeting room and it just involves you know like mounting it on the wall um that would be an allowable cost mm -hmm. but if you need to hire an electrician to come in or a contractor to come in and, and you know run wiring um, or things like that, that wouldn't be an allowable cost. And those of you who did uh, some of the CARES Act grants, you may, if you did apply for uh, things like the um, plexiglass shields at the mm -hmm. um, desk, installing those was included and allowed in that right. same kind of thing here, that kind of a quick, it can be um, you know, screwed in and unscrewed and taken down pretty, pretty easily. That's that. Yeah, that's that's like, the other requirement is, you know, is it fixed or movable? I mean, on a lot of things, you know, IMLS has said, you know, like like with furniture, um, you know, it has to be movable furniture or movable stacks um, or taken out like with a screwdriver. Um, a lot of libraries in other states are doing um, projects with lockers. And I think we mentioned this on the website. Mm -hmm. So they're doing storage lockers either for, you know, like vestibule pickups or 
um, package deliveries, things like that. Sometimes when you're not uh, open. So if it's, you know, if you have a contractor come in and put a wall in and, you know, permanently affix it to the wall, that's probably not, that labor is not going to be an allowable cost. But, you know, if it just screws into the wall or sits in the vestibule and is freestanding, it's probably going to be, it would be an allowable cost. So that's kind of, I mean, I realize that's, there's a lot of different scenarios though. So if you have a project that you're thinking of, um, yeah, just ask us ahead of time. And we'll, if we don't know, we'll find the answer for you. Yeah. Um, so then that one, we have a question here that I think we just right there answered. Uh, remodeling our bathrooms? No, that's uh, that would, more no, than, that would be. yeah, not from the, the ZARPA money, no. Um, what about exterior electronic signage? Um, hmm. We have done that before with levy improvement grants. So that's not as huge a project, I guess. They have approved that before. Yeah, and it might depend on the project. I mean, if it's something that, you know, the wiring is already there and you just plug in and it, you know, just gets mounted to the side of the building, mm -hmm. that probably, probably would be an allowable cost. Um, you know, in the ineligible section of the website, it talks about promotional things. So promotional materials that say, come to the library, it's a great place, that those aren't allowable costs. But if you're promoting a sp specific thing, you know, like overdrive, for instance, um, that would be an allowable cost. So keep that in mind with the promotional part. Um, but as far as the signage goes, it may depend on the nature of the project. Like with something that you just plug in, it probably would be allowable. If it's something that requires major construction, it probably wouldn't be allowable. Um, and then we have another thing about wanting to expand an outdoor space. If you want to expand an outdoor space, picnic tables with a covered shelter, is this not eligible? Actually, we have that listed that outdoor. Yeah, that is. Yeah, actually. outdoor spaces, as a lot of libraries have reconfigured their outdoor spaces. Um, some of the items that are. Um, mentioned on our website include like patio heaters, you know, portable things like that, um, umbrellas if they're movable, mm, picnic tables, tables if they're movable. Tables. Yeah. yeah outdoor tables um, in the CARES Act. So yes, actually the outdoor space, um, that's part of being safe for a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, we also mentioned charging stations and story walks. Um, yep. I think story walks are kind of a unique thing because if it requires a lot of construction, I don't think that's allowed. Um, if it's just something that just gets pushed into the ground, mm -hmm. um, it probably would be an it would be an allowable cost. But if you're talking about having a contractor come in and dig Lake holes and pour concrete, <laughs> yeah, it's probably not going to be allowed. Again. And going over the line, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And then, oh, this is a good time actually to talk about this before we get on to the next slide here. Uh, would um, a Hoopla subscription be covered? Yes, but, but it can't go beyond the the subscription period that you're paying for. It can't go beyond um, would it be the May date or September, Sam? Well, it definitely would be September 30th. Okay. Um, would be the drop the end date for digital. Yeah, so, so we're having you guys give us all you know submit the invoices and the. Uh, Final report invoices by May, final report in June, um, because of our needing to report to IMLS. The actual date when we have to have all the money expended and have everything everything totally done is actually end of September 2022. So that kind of falls in the case for this kind of thing and a subscription, you would have to do just a year subscription that ends before that and that's all you can pay for. You can't do like a multi-year subscription and just say it's for the one year. Um, you'd have to have a, we're doing a one year Hoopla subscription and that's it. And then yes, if you want to continue after that, then you'll have to start a new contract, a new you know, year with them with other costs for beyond the September, end of September 22 date. So yes. And I, and I would say if you're looking at those types of projects that involve databases or um, that type of thing to let us know that you will maybe be extending it past that May 31st deadline be, for that reason, or that you would require a waiver of that deadline. And yeah. we can take yeah. a look at that. And another thing to indicate is that, so overdrive, um, because their lending models are kind of wonky. And we um, did just get a question came in for about overdrive. 
<laughs> if you're if you're looking at funding those types of things, Devra Dragos in our um, here at Nebraska Library Commission, she has dealt with that as far as the consortium goes. So um, because there's certain rules, you you know it can't extend past that deadline. So I would say that if you're looking for purchasing advantage titles or whatever, um, to maybe check with her, um, you know, kind of for some guidance on that. Yeah, so so Becky, I'm gonna say your question about using money by content from Overdrive. We're gonna pass you off to Deborah for that. Mm -hmm. So reach out to Deborah Dragos if you have any Overdrive related, because she yeah, it is we Sam and I don't know enough about that yeah. to answer confidently. Yeah, and we're I okay do, with I, that because we have Deborah right. for us. <laughs> I will say that like the the issue I think is that some libraries on Overdrive are you know, a, set num a certain number of uses. So if you purchased an ebook that said had, you know, say 40 uses, um, those uses can't extend past that drop dead date of September 30th. And that's the issue. So it may be just a question of purchasing titles that would expire before that date. Um, but she's dealt with it, so she can help you with that. Yeah, she knows all about that. All right. Okay, so um, in kind of looking at community need, your community needs, IMLS has identified three focal areas um, or things that you could look at in trying to determine how to spend these money, this money. Um, SNAP statistics or poverty supplemental nutrition assistant program, um, unemployment and broadband availability. So that third part is we you know when we talk about these digital inclusion things. You could also look at like how maybe the pandemic has affected your community as far as unemployment goes, and maybe that's an area that you want to focus on, either with your print collections, digital collections, um, maybe other projects. Um, you know, maybe there's programs involving um, unemployment specialists or um, other things that you could focus on um, if your community has those needs. So these are three areas that they've kind of said you might want to look at. Um, for data. So if you're unsure of what you might spend this on, these are some areas to look into, yeah. Yeah, or talk to people in the community too. You know, that's always a great idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so more rules. <laughs> more rules. Um, a good the, rule. The good, good rule, rule is no here. local match is required. So Yay. there's no local match on your part. Um, that's always been a, a issue with uh, work a requirement with library improvement grants is there's a 25 percent local match required so for yeah, these formula grants. grants there is no local match required um, and i will mention here while we're talking about it and i should have it on that first slide too about it this go is going to go for our youth grants and our library improvement grants this year as well mm -hmm. because this is arpa funding no local match so if that has been something also has been holding you back from doing applying for a youth grant or a library improvement grant, we have previously had that 25% match that you had to come up with funding. This year, one time only, you don't have to. You just can get the whole amount for your full your, your project will be fully funded by um, the grant funds. And that was also the case with the CARES Act. There was no local yes. match too, so. Yep, this is um, a, so the special stimulus funding is, has that deal, yeah. So that's another incentive to apply for those competitive grants. Um, but one thing that you should be aware of, um, we have a requirement, um, if you're an accredited library, an MOE or maintenance of effort, I should have spelled out that acronym. So MOE is maintenance of effort requirement. Um, those still apply. So if you're an accredited library, we have a maintenance of effort requirement where we could potentially reduce your state aid if your local funding does not um, continue at the same level. Mm -hmm. So you need to be aware that, you know, if your city government um, is talking about maybe reducing the local funding because of, you know, these other funds that are available this one time, that you should be aware that um, the MOE requirement still does apply and your state aid might be reduced if, if that's in the future more than the pre three prior years. Um, and then federal non-discrimination rules apply. Um, that's built into the application. For those of you who have looked at the application, um, there's a great big boilerplate down at the bottom that kind of summarizes all these statutes. Um, 
about federal non-discrimination rules. Um, so you should be aware of those um, in the application itself um, if you want to look at those. And then, like I said earlier, you can submit your invoices at any time, scan them and email them, um, send paper copies via US mail, or fax them. And go to Sam's the, attention. I don't want them. <laughs> yeah, send them to my attention. Sam's the, good, is doing all the paperwork behind the scenes for this grant. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the contact person for the formula grants, and then um, Krista would be the contact person for the library improvement grants, and then Sally Snyder would be the contact person for the youth grants. As so usual. Keep that in mind. Um, but you can submit those completion reports when they become available. It'll be an online form. If you want to look at the Word doc, kind of to prepare for that, um, it's available on our website. Now the DUNS number. I know we've gotten some questions about the DUNS number. And um, this is so something the, new. You have not had to do this before. New, so if yeah. you've never heard of this, if you've done grants this before, that's okay. <laughs> right. So IMLS now requires uh, a federal UEI unique identity entity identifier. <laughs> Um, that's not a UEI. It's too hard to say. UEI. Um, that's not a requirement for sub subrecipients, which you are under the formula grants. We're the recipient from IMLS. You're the subrecipient. Um, currently, that UEI is a Dunn's number that's available for free from Dunn and Bradstreet, um, and the links down at the bottom of this page. Um, in many cases, your city or village may already have a Dunn's number. Um, so you can look that up on that website. You can go in and type in um, your information and it um, will indicate if you already have a number. Um, the application, you'll have to put the number on the application. There's a spot to enter your number. Um, I believe that next year um, this is going to change. The DUNS number will go away and it'll be replaced by something else. So that'll be something that we'll have to deal with later on with um, future sub subgrants. Um, like library next improvement year. grants or whatever. We'll talk about that next but year. For now, it's just the DUNS number and it, it's relatively simple. If you have questions, um, feel free to contact me. I can help you with it. But in most cases, you may already have the DUNS number. If you don't, you can apply for it and it doesn't cost anything. It's free. And then we do have a question about this. We have had this question asked a lot. Can the library use the city's number? And the answer is yes. If your city has the number, um, just go ahead and yeah, just go ahead and type that in, um, enter that in your application, and that's that should be all, all we need on our end. Mm -hmm. And then um, an E-rate related question: Is the UEI the same as the EI for E-rate? I assume you mean entity build entity number in E-rate. Is that what you're talking about, Karen? Because the answer is no. This is um, this is a whole different number. A Dunn's number is, is this is for doing business with the FCC. You have to, with with the government. You have to have one of these numbers. So this is not any. This is not the same thing as um, E rate. Uh, the E rate number. Nope. It's a whole different one. All right. There we go. There it goes. Okay. Aha. The formula. So the formula itself, we talked about that earlier, about the base amount and then the per capita allocations. If you want to know what your library is, is eligible for, you can go to this URL. And uh, that's the chart you know, that we talked about earlier by city, library name, then your allocation. And then we've also added a fourth column on the right-hand side for application status. Um, so you can check on where your application's at. Um, like I said, we have 35 libraries that have already been approved, submitted their application and been approved. Um, so on the website, that for those libraries, it shows the status as in process. That, I think we'll that pop means, over to the website right now and I'll show, I want to show that. Sure, yeah. Actually, so what, so, um, so what that means is they've been approved and they are um, sent over to our accountant for payment. Um, once they once they are paid, that'll be updated from in process to to payment sent, and um, then you can you know you should be able, should get the funds relatively quickly after that. Yeah. and that actually answers a couple of questions too that um, we have. Want someone to know uh, does the money come in all in one lump sum as soon as it's approved, or after receipts are submitted, and when will the grant be distributed? So um, the way this works, this is a 
quick so it's not after the receipts are submitted but that was in earlier questions so i think you've gotten the answer to that you you apply you get the money then you start sending us invoices um, and this is a quick turnaround as possible we want to get this out to you so this is the list here of, of you can see that some in process of all everyone who's eligible for it as far as we are as far as we know, like Sam said, if we missed you for some reason or you think someone else should be on this list, let us know how much each library is getting and then what the status is. Uh, as soon as we get your application, it is immediately the same day or next day at the latest. Mm -hmm. Looked over by Sam, approved, passed on to our accountant. Then they immediately start the payment process. So the distribution of these funds will be as soon as you send us your application. We have had some libraries ask about this, that can they delay receiving the funding because they want it to be in next year's budget. Wait until their fiscal year starts, which is sometimes in October um, or September, rather than right now when it's available. And um, that's okay. You just wait to submit the application then. Mm -hmm. Um, you have until December 31st to do this, so you got plenty of time. So if you want to have this money come to you at a certain date later, not like next week, <laughs> not like in July, just wait to put in your application. Right. Like we said, you are not going to be luck, out of luck. All this money, this 1.4 million, is already allotted. All of this is set aside for all of you guys to all the library, all of you libraries to apply for. You're not going to lose out on it if you wait until December or October or November or whenever. It's just being held for you to let us know when you want it. So if you do need it in next year's budget, just wait to submit your application because that's when the, the process will start for um, issuing the money to you. And I would say generally speaking, you'd probably be looking at about two to four weeks to receive payment. But a lot of that depends on how many applications are in front of you um, because they're processed, you know, in order of receipt. And then, you know, if I'm on vacation or if our accountant's on vacation, that would maybe delay the process somewhat. Yes. But the, the, idea right is to get you, the idea is to get you the money as fast as we can. So we don't want to try and delay things. Once you file the application, we're trying to move relatively quickly to get the money out to you. Exactly. Um, and we do have a couple of questions which have been asked directly of us already um, about having this sent to the library foundation. Um, can it be sent there? Or a question is who receives the funds? My city? Or can it be sent? Unless you tell us different right now, the funding for all of you that get state aid funding or dollars for data money, however you get that money right now, that is where the money will be sent and how it will be sent to you. We're using the same process. So where if your state aid money is going to a good place, the right place you want it to, and that's okay for this money to go there, that is where it will go. Um, so if you have it sent, some people have it sent to a library account and that's fine. They can, we can do uh, checks we can cut and mail and mail anywhere or electronic funds transfer we do sometimes. Uh, it can go to the library's account, it can go to the city's account if they then, the city, your city um, or village then does pass that on to you. And that's the key, that money has to be passed on to the library. They cannot hold it yep. and keep it in some general fund that the city then uses for everybody. This money has to end up in the hands of the library. Now, if that's an issue, we recommend you have a friends group or a foundation that does this, is where you have this money sent instead. And I've, we've talked to libraries, Richard Miller before, before me, we've talked to many of you about this over the years. If that is an issue, get your foundation or your friends group set up with an account and, and tell us you want the, the money sent there. And we can do that. You just have to let us know. Um, we will need to, if we don't already have on hand for you, a, a W-9 form with your um, tax ID number for that organization, for the foundation, the friends group, or the, if the library even has its own bank account, wherever you want it to go. Um, and then that is where we will send it and we can have it, like I said, paper check mailed to you or electronic funds transfer, whichever works best for you. So you tell us where you want it sent. If you don't know where your money is going, just ask. <laughs> um, I've been doing that a lot with our accountant, Laura, and asking, where does this library's money go? They're not really sure. And she can check it and within a day or so, we can find out where it currently is going and if you think you need to make a change. And I would say two things there. So if you have your state aid payment or your dollars for data going to your foundation or your friends group instead of, you know, the library directly, um, just drop me a note and indicate that you want this money to go to the friends group or foundation just so that we make sure we're on the same page 
Yeah. Um, so sometimes, that's sometimes what both may be set up as paid. Email right after we apply, so we know what we prefer. That wouldn't be a bad idea if you're not sure. We I mean, want to just confirm. Yeah. Yeah. Just let me know, and then email, and we'll we can then, double. Secondly, if you want the money to go to your friends group or foundation, the application is still filed by the library. So you would still you wouldn't the, the foundation or the friends group wouldn't fill out the application. The library itself would fill out the application and then just send me a separate email or notify me that you filed your application, you want the payment to go to your friends group, and then I'll make a note to our accountant mm -hmm. to make sure that the check gets sent or the direct deposit gets made to the friends group or foundation. Yeah. Um so while we're here, uh, we're, we're asking about this because we, we just have, so it is a little after three o'clock. Like I said, we will go as long as it takes for you to have all your questions asked and for us to get through everything we want to share. There's only one extra slide after this that has to do with something extra, but people are asking. So here is the website for the formula grants. Um, as I said, you can just search also type in ARPA and you will get to it and it's linked into everything about this webinar. Um, where we have the application itself is here and that list we just went to. Uh, after this webinar is done, I've got the recording ready probably tomorrow. This here will have a link to the recording of today's session. Right now it's a link to signing up for what you're attending right now, but we'll have a link to the recording there for anyone that needs to rewatch it or anyone who wasn't here. Um, we've got our deadlines, um, the statutes we're talking about that relate to whether you, you are um, a legally established library or not, all those goals we talked about, and here the examples of what to spend your funding on. So um, as it says here, this is not exhaustive. There might be other things that are listed. This is just ideas. And these we've looked at other states who are doing fund, um, ARPA funding, uh, information we've received from IMLS about what we can and can't do so just look through this for ideas and um what you you know might want to do as you can see this is and if you do remember the cares act this is much longer than that um your cleaning supplies your ppe the usual still but things like collections print electronic ebooks um and here that's that question and answer that we're just saying all subscriptions have to end by september 30th if you do anything like that hoopla or anything um more detail about what is ineligible is on here too, digging into that. Um, this is the final report. As Sam said, this is a Word doc right now, just an example. Uh, so you can prepare for what you will be. We will have an online form that you'll actually submit later. And then just some more of the rules and regulations about it. Um, we also have a general page for everything we're doing with our, the other two grants that we we're doing uh, with this ARPA funding as well. Um, so there's a, the three grants, the formula grants open now, and then library improvement and youth. We plan on both of those coming, um, being available in, in August, which is next month. Okay, uh, we'll get on that. Let's, I'll get on that with Sally. <laughs> uh, the rules will be similar to both of those as what is for the formula grants as far as um, the goal, because it's all the same goals, because it's all the same ARPA funding, the same ineligible costs, so a lot of it's similar. The difference would be our youth grants and our library improvement grants do have their own focuses. Uh, youth, obviously, for things that are for your youth and teen uh, programs you're doing there. Library improvement grants, generally things for makerspace equipment, um, upgrading your uh, library automation system, if you're thinking about doing that, other sort of technology things, so you know, bigger projects like that. Uh, so look for those to open up, hopefully. Yes, next month, before the end of August, I promise both of those will be available for you. Um, so this is also so you can decide, we've got these three pots of money available to us. What do we want to use each pot of money for? I've got a youth project for next summer I want to do or something over the winter or something. Let's get that in the youth grant. And then I've got, I want to, we're upgrading our um, online catalog. Let's do a library improvement grant. And now I've got this formula grant for all the other things that didn't fall into those two. So, you know, think about all three of those of which ones you can apply for, for which projects. Remembering, of course, lab improvement and youth are competitive. Um, you may or may not be approved. We may or may not have full funding to, enough funding to fully fund your project, but um, they are there and they both have a lot more money available to them. Anything else we wanted to show here, Sam, while I'm on these pages before I... <laughs> I don't think so. There's a lot of information there, so I just encourage you to go out there and read through it. Um, mm -hmm. We've tried to provide answers to the most frequent questions. Um, 
but if something you know doesn't fall under that just send us an email we'll try and answer it mm -hmm. yep so okay okay well we got a question here i'm confused the youth grant is part of the money assigned to each library or is another fund the youth grant for excellence we've got it's what it says right here we've got three different grant projects the formula grants that are available right now that is just here's a chunk of money assigned to you mm -hmm ask us for it, then two competitive grants coming up, the Library Improvement and the Youth Grants for Excellence. Now, you are welcome to use your formula grants for whatever you want. You can use it for a youth program if you want to, or for something that would go under a Library Improvement Grant, like someone mentioned wanting to get a, a laser cutter or something. You're welcome to use your formula grant for those things. That's a guaranteed chunk of money. But if you have bigger thoughts and you want to use that formula grant for something else, you want to apply for youth grant instead for your youth things you could do that it's totally up to you how you want to use these three different pots of money um and you're welcome to just say formula grant only formula grant only because it's guaranteed money not you know risky to, of possibly being not approved um so yeah and the other thing that i would mention is that kind of um Library improvement grants and youth grants for excellence are typically funded with just our general LSTA allocation. And so I think what Krista was mentioning earlier is that the, there's a bigger pot of money this year because we've allocated some money of the ARPA funding yes. um, for those two grant programs. Mm -hmm. So much bigger pot of money for so both. There's a little bit more funding money. available. Yeah, much bigger pot of money and both of them eligible, more people, more libraries eligible. Mm -hmm. And you could always apply for your formula grant money and just hold it. Um, exactly. If you yeah. wanted to apply for a library improvement grant for a specific project, and mm -hmm. then if the project got approved, you could use your formula grant money later on this fall for something else. We are um, gonna try and do a very quick turnaround for the library improvement and youth grants of getting you your answers so that you can decide um, effectively how you're going to use the formula grant so mm -hmm. yeah i would say apply get the formula grant no matter what and then still apply for a youth grant for some project you have mm -hmm. improved library improvement for some project um i would estimate if we're opening up in august maybe by october we'd be able to have an answer to you about both of those and then you can decide based on if you did or didn't get approved for the two competitive grants now, what do I actually use the money for? I got the youth grant, great. Now I can use formula for something else. Or I didn't get the youth grant, or I only got half of the cost covered by the youth grant. I can cover the other half with my formula grant money. And that's perfectly you know, fine. Um, you know, Hold it and wait and see what happens. Or spend it right away if you have an immediate <laughs> need to. Yes, you know. if you do, yeah. It's burning a hole in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> And so this is exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. It's exciting for us too. It's exciting. It's confusing. It's a lot to figure out and think about. It's a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. So go for it. All right. Um, I have one other thing to talk about, but um, any other last minute, any other ARPA questions you want to ask about any of these grants or about the formula-based grant that you're wondering about? Um, take a look at the website. Um, read through it. Take a deep dive, think about what you could do with it, apply for your money. These formula grants are just wait, this is just money waiting for you to request it. All right. So wait, I've had some people asking about uh, double dipping. Uh, and I, I mentioned I mentioned this at the, be, at the beginning that there is a lot of ARPA funding out there, a lot of um, states, cities, counties, agencies have been awarded, you know, agriculture department, department of education, everybody's got some sort of part of this money that they have been awarded to distribute. And you can apply for multiple things and from multiple parts of money, just like with our three grants, you can apply for all three of those. They're all ARPA funds, but they're different parts of ARPA. So you can apply for all of them. There is no double, you know, dipping here. Uh, one other thing that people have been confused about, and I know Sam and I have both gotten questions about this, is, well, what if, I thought we already knew about this. What about, didn't, you know, Chris already tell us about money for this? No, there is something else that's available right now too called the Emergency Connectivity Fund, the ECF. I did a webinar about it last 
month? Yeah. Um, this is another one-time program, part of ARPA, but it is for a specific purpose. You can also apply for our ARPA grants and apply for this. They're two separate things. This is not something that we are offering to the Library Commission. This is something that's coming from the FCC. The FCC was awarded money to help support remote learning, to close that homework gap, the connectivity gap. Um, they got a lot of money for that, 7.1 billion, that's because it's for the whole country, <laughs> for K-12 schools and public libraries to um, get money for broadband access, internet access, and devices to provide internet um, services to their uh, students and uh, library patrons. The key to this is it is not E-rate, it is not an expansion of E-rate, although it does sound similar to those of you who've done E-rate before. And just to be more confusing, it is actually being administered by USAC, the same company that does run E-rate, and that it is using the same uh, basic interface to online uh, interface to request this funding. So the FCC runs USAC and has them doing both E-Rate and this thing, two different programs, two different purposes. E-Rate is for having your internet connectivity into your library. This is actually specifically expanding it off campus outside the library. That's the key to the emergency connectivity fund, not to be used for inside your library. This is remote learning is happening. People are working from home. People are going to school elsewhere. People are attending classes at a community center or whatever, and they don't have the internet connection or they don't have the actual device, laptop, tablets, Wi-Fi hotspots, and you as a library can purchase these items, receive funding from the University Connectivity Fund, and then lend it out to your um, your patrons. Um, so does SIPA apply to that, Krista? Yes, SIPA yes. does apply okay. because it's internet related, yes. So your lab, your, you would have to have filtering in that off-campus connection? If, um, or on the device? Yes, or on the device, yes, okay. that you are lending out, yes. Um, as I said, there's there's a website specifically for it, the emergencyconnectivityfund.org is where you go to apply for this. There is a filing window, if those of you who know E-Rate, this just sounds familiar, a certain time period when you have to apply for this, and this deadline is coming up August 13th. It opened June 29th, you have till August 13th to apply for this funding. Um, there's a lot of training information on that website, emergencyconnectivityfund.org. There's my webinar I did, and you can ask me questions about it as well. Um, as Since it's something being done in the similar process as using E-Rate, um, me as your state E-Rate coordinator, I am the contact to help you get through this process as well. Um, there are some funding caps and rules about the money you'll get. You get for your internet service and anything related to connecting the internet, 100% reimbursement. There's no discount rate and partial and you have to pay part. It's full reimbursement of all of that. Um, for laptops and tablets and Wi-Fi hotspots, there are funding caps. The FCC did determine that laptops, they're only gonna cover $400 worth of it, part of it, and for hotspots, only $250. Um, you're welcome to buy something that's more expensive, but you only, you know, you can buy a $600 laptop, but you only get $400 of it from the emergency connectivity fund. Um, so look more into it. There's a lot more details about this. I'm not gonna go into it all now. Like I said, I did a webinar about it. There's a lot of information on the website. Um, Ask me questions if you do have any about it. But I just wanted to make sure, because people had been asking, now that we've announced our ARPA grants, if that was the same thing as this. No, it's not. It's two separate things. And can you apply for both? Both, absolutely. Decide which one is best for you. You know, if you notice on our ARPA website, things like broadband, internet connections, laptops, tablets, this is all listed on our website, too, that you can use our formula grants um, to apply, to, to pay for, but you can use this funding as well. So more things to compare and decide which money I should use. Um, the ECF funding caps are per device. Yes, that is exactly it. So um, if you're gonna buy 10 laptops, it would be $400 per laptop. Yes, and per hotspot. So just want to be aware that that's out there. And there's, like we said, there's lots of other ones. So look for other funding. Um, to some people, that's a bit overwhelming, too much money. <laughs> but start dreaming about what you could do. And Tammy says, the world is your oyster. Yeah, there's so much out there. You just got to sit down and figure out what will I apply for? What will I use for what project? And yeah. 
And there is our contact information. Um, oh, oh, sorry, funding cap for iPads. Oh, laptops and tablets, any laptop or tablet is $400 per. So um, Chromebooks, any sort of tablets, Chromebooks, laptops, iPads, um, not desktop computers, specifically this is about being remote and being um, move, not mobile, mobile, that's it. So laptops and tablets you can carry. And it'd be $400 per iPad, per Chromebook, per laptop, tablet, whatever. And is there, a, is there a limit on the number of devices then? You could, could you ask for 20 laptops at $300 a pop? $400. Or well, it's less than four hundred. Yeah, yeah. It's well. So as long as it's max. under four hundred, four hundred max. Okay, so under right. four hundred dollars. If it costs less than that, you'll get just what it costs. You won't get. Okay, extra. gotcha. You just be, like you buy a three hundred dollar so iPad. You get a nicer. It. You can get a nicer laptop then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, no, there's not a limit. Uh, the way it works is the idea of this is also it's to close the homework gap for people that are, are are not cannot afford to have the tablet or laptop or the internet connectivity where they are that's the key too it's about people who can't afford it so as a library you're just going to say there's a part on the form where you say yes our patrons are in need of this they're in, they're needy um and you buy as many as you think you're going to lend need to lend out um, for schools it's done by yes we know because we know our students and we have statistics 100 of our students don't have this at home and need it so you can ask for money to buy 100 100, 100 chromebooks or whatever exactly yes okay. um for libraries it's more of an ephemeral thing it's like you got to kind of guess how many would we possibly lend out what's the demand you've probably got statistics on that somewhere that you might know a way to figure that out and you, there's no limit on how many you just you decide how you are determining the need and you just tell you Zach we've used this process to you know these statistics that we know how many we might need to lend out and that's why we're asking for 20 laptops or however many words mm -hmm. yeah. right. and there's our contact info email direct phone numbers call the 800 number it gets through forwarded to us as well um, Sam and I are both working part, partially at home, partially in the office. That's okay. We get our email or our voicemails are sent to our email and we have access to those when we're working from home. So we can always, we'll always get your uh, calls and emails. So any other, anything else you want to wrap up and say, Sam? I don't think so. I, just, I know that there's probably questions that'll come up later and just send us an email and we'll, you know, try and get you an answer as fast as we can. Any last minute desperate questions you guys want to ask right now, get it into the questions section. Um, like I said, it's, we're about 325 here, so we did run over our hour, but we said we would. Uh, we wanted to make sure we get everything out there and any questions you had right now asked. But reach out to us. This is something we're going to be dealing with for the next year for us <laughs> and beyond as we wrap things up. And during this webinar, I got three more applications submitted. <laughs> so, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there are people on this call or not on the call, but three more. Multicasting, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we just got a lot of thank yous coming in. Very informative. We're happy that it was. Um, download the you know if you can grab the if you didn't grab the powerpoint off of the handout section of the GoToWebinar right now that's okay when i put the recording up it'll be linked there as well you'll have a copy there you can access as well of, of the slides and another thing that another thing that i just thought of that you can do is if you want to look at the application you can open it up just don't submit it if you you know yeah. we're curious as to you know how the layout is it's pretty we tried to make it as simple as possible um just your information you know, mm -hmm. identify that you're a legal established library, meaning those two criteria that we talked about earlier. Um, and yeah. then the DUNS number, the SIPA compliance. Um, and if you're not SIPA compliant, it doesn't mean that you're not eligible. It just means that if you are planning to use the money for those technology related things, you have to be SIPA compliant. So you couldn't spend it on, you know, like things that devices that weren't um, filtered. 
Yeah, so the compliance not required. It's only if you're going to plan on purchasing things that access the internet and or work on getting connected to the internet. Right, and then the assurances section, which is all that boilerplate about non-discrimination and every other things. And you just and read two, all of that, yep. and, and then finally, the two, down here, you sign it. <laughs> and then the two requirements that you will submit the invoices and the completion report. Mm -hmm. um, those are the, the last two pieces that you need to do. And that's it. And if you go off of this, it says, ah, are you sure you want to leave? I just, there's a link to that at the bottom to go back to the main grant page. And yes, it's okay. Yep. All right, that's lots of thank yous. All right, I think we will wrap it up then. Um, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully it did get you everything you need to know about applying to our formula grants. Uh, look for information coming about the youth and the library improvement grants. Email Sam or myself with any questions you may have. Yep, and the recording will be up as soon as it's available. I will. My goal is to have it done by the end of the day tomorrow. What am I looking at? Yes. As long as uh, go to webinar and it goes onto our YouTube channel, go to webinar on YouTube, cooperate with me, you should have it by the end of tomorrow. And I'll let everyone who attended today and registered today will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready. And we'll change this link here to be the link to the actual recording um, with the slides as well. Yep. All right. Thank you, everybody. Apply Thank for that you, money. Everyone. <laughs>